back and leave it. Who life gives to all his children, talents both great and small. My gifts belong to Jesus. I'll let him use them all. I want to be faithful. I want to be true. I want to be faithful in all that I do. I want to be faithful through every test. And I want to be faithful. I want to give him my best. When we are serving Jesus, no task can be too small. If we obey the Savior, then we will hear his call. I want to be faithful, and I want to be true. I want to be faithful in all that I do. I want to be faithful through every test. I want to be faithful, and I'll give him my best. I want to live for Jesus. I want to please God's Son. Amen. If he has found me faithful, I'll hear him say, well done. I want to be faithful. I want to be true. I want to be faithful in all that I do. I want to be faithful through every test. I want to be faithful. I'll give him my best. And I, I'd like to ask y'all to pray for me. I've never had uh, the desire to be a church pianist. That's just not on my list of things to be. I'm a teacher. And God called me to be a teacher, and that's what I know God called me to do. The piano thing, I just picked up along the way, and I'm thankful that I can play what I can play because I was an adult before I actually learned. Uh, my sister was the one that played 10 years, and, and she doesn't even play. <laughs> that's kind of funny. But anyway, it just shows you what God can do. But I appreciate if y'all would, uh, when you pray, pray that God would help me because I, I don't want to... Um, to be a Liberace or, you know, <laughs> my daddy always, said, now my daddy led the music and I played sometimes, you know, Miss Carol always did Sunday morning or whatever, but my daddy always told me, would you leave out that fancy stuff and just play it? <laughs> so I appreciate it if you would pray for me that God would help me. And if God's will is to send someone else to play, I have no problem with that. I'd probably be more relaxed. That was one reason I couldn't learn well is because I get nervous and I get up high. And then another thing, if y'all have a favorite song, I mean, I grew up with the uh, All-American, and that's the one I learned to play from. But I can play some out of the church hymnal. But if anybody has a song on your heart and you have a favorite song you really want me to play, um, I usually like to practice before so that we're all not embarrassed when I try to play. <laughs> but if you let me know, I don't mind at all to try to play some of your favorites. I understand that. Anyway, thank you. Let's see the Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 7. Gospel according to Luke, chapter 7. I'll preach fast, y'all listen fast, amen. I just got about a three or four hour message. I hope you can listen down about an hour and a half, two hours. Some of you listen. I see your face. That's good. I just checked. Gospel according to Luke, chapter 7, uh, verse number 18. We're going to begin reading for this evening's text. Luke, chapter 7, verse 18. The Bible said, And the disciples of John shewed him of all these things. And John calling unto him, two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or, or look we for another? And in the same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard and how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Father, we thank you and praise you once again for this another good day you've given us, Lord. We just ask you to be with us now. Help us for the next few minutes. Bless your people. Speak to us and through us. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. 
Amen and amen. You can look now, for time's sake, I'm not going to because I preach on every verse or every word, and I'm going to try to be quick. I'm studying to be quiet and failing miserably. But in, in the first 17 verses of this chapter, Jesus is performing many miracles. Mm -hmm. There's a soldier that's come, and he said, I'm not even worthy for you to come to my house, but if you just speak the words, I do this miracle. And Jesus said, so great a faith is not found in all of Israel. We can read about the widow of Nain and her son and the miracle Jesus went out and laid his hand upon the buyer and said, young man, arise. And, and there's a lot of things that are going on right here in this chapter. We begin in verse 18, and, and John the Baptist's disciples has come to him and said, John, listen, this man's still going around doing many miracles, and there's still things going on. And I begin to think about in your life and in my life. It seems like our bad situations get worse and, and it seems like all we have is bad news and it seems like there ain't nothing good going on but I'm glad there's still good news from a far country and I'm glad. I was telling the men back in the Sunday school room, Brother Eddie got saved wins and I'm so glad for that. I praise God for it and rejoice with that and a friend of mine, he, he goes to church somewhere between Corrington and Luttrell up here and they're closing out their Bible school Friday night. Me and him was riding around a little bit Friday at work during the day and he said, man, I'll be glad this over. So it's been a horrible week. Everything that could go wrong has been wrong. And, and I'm just ready for it to be done with. Thank God tonight's the last time. I checked my phone about 9.30 or 9.45 Friday night and had a text. And he said, praise God, brother. There was four teenagers. Got <laughs> saved by the good grace of God. So hey, just because things going bad right here or right there don't mean God's not moving somewhere else, all right? But here in our, here in our text, we find John, he's, he's sitting in a prison cell. Yeah. He, he's mm -hmm. preached the gospel. He's preached the message God gave to him. But he's told the king, said, it's not right for you to have your brother's wife. And, and it's ungodly. Hey, sin is still sin. I don't care if it's 1900 or 2000 or 2021. God said it. That settles it. Whether you believe it or whether I believe it doesn't really make a difference. If it was wrong in the beginning, it's wrong in the end. I don't care what the Pope says. I don't care what the politicians say. I don't care what the president said. God said it. Amen. It's wrong. It's bad. It's sin. And God's going to judge whether the whether judicial system does or not. So that, that's the end of that right quick. But here he is. He's went and he's preached the message. And they decided, hey, we're going to wrap him up. We're going to imprison him. And, and he asked the girl what she wanted for her birthday. And her mother's told her, said, I want John the Baptist's head on the charger. Hey, just because you do away with the God of man, that never mean you're going to do away with the God. Just because you do away with the man of God, let me rephrase that, doesn't mean you're going to do away with the God of man. They killed martyr after martyr after martyr after martyr. They took Jesus to Calvary and he laid down his life that you and I might have more life and have it more abundant. But the word of God still stands and God still sits on the throne. Yeah. So it wasn't going away. It wasn't going to change. But here he's sitting here in this state and John's starting to ponder on some things. I don't know about you, but there's been situations and circumstances <coughs> come in my life. And, and I've looked at them after this back of the wood and I thought, boy, I could have done a little differently right there. And some of them I was just straight up wrong. And I know that shocks you all. Y'all would have never guessed that I've ever done wrong. My wife's sitting back there thinking, oh my gosh, surely he hadn't. But I, she lives with me. She knows better. But the thing is that whether I want to admit it or not, there's times I've been in the wrong spirit. I've been in the wrong mindset. And I, I did the right thing for the wrong reason or in the wrong spirit. And I've sit back and I've had to think about it. But as John's sitting here on death row, if you will, he's sitting here in this prison and, and he's sitting there and, and he begins to think about some things and, and he says, man, they're fixing to take my life. They're fixing to behead me and I'm going to die. And, and he might have been wondering, is it worth dying for? Is it a good cause? Is it a good reason or whatever? I don't know what the devil's put on his mind. But as he begins to sit there and ask some questions, it's not a bad thing to question some things. But then he starts questioning God. Who am I to question God? Who am I to ask him anything? But he asks him a question. He starts asking this question. And these men are trying to encourage him and they're trying to help him. They can't be bad. They should have been kicking him while he was down. I pick on them because it is there. But they come to him and they're saying, Hey, John, God's moving. God's doing these things. They're healing. They're doing all these things. Maybe you're next. And he said, saying, hey, would you go have Jesus come to me or do whatever? He said, uh, I want you to go to this man. And I want you to ask him, is he the one we're supposed to be looking for? Or should we look for another? So here these men are, and, and they begin to think about these things. And I begin to think about in our life how many times that our burdens 
take away the thought of our blessing. You can, have you ever noticed that? Y'all stay with me for a minute. I'll be done. But have you ever noticed you can have the greatest day or the greatest week of your life ever, and all it takes is one text message, one phone call, and you forget all about the good things, and oh my gosh, it, it's woe and pain and agony and distress, and, and your whole life falls apart over one thing. Instead of seeing, man, God did this and God did that and, and He blessed me with this and He gave me with that and all these other things, we, we get so tied up in the minute. What's going on right this minute? What's going on right this second? We forget God's blessed us throughout our whole life. He's took care of our other problems and He's going to take care of this one too. But that's how we're wired. That's how our flesh is. That's how our mind is. That's what the devil causes us to do. But John was, if you will, I understand the, the principles and all that. He's just as saved as you and I are, if you will. Jesus himself later on in these verses, after these disciples walk away, look at everybody standing around. He said, I want you to know something. He said, there wasn't a greater man ever born a woman than John the Baptist. What a testimony to have. I've heard people talk about these folks, say, man, they're the greatest whatever. I'm like, you don't know them. You don't know all. But Jesus just said there wasn't a greater man ever born a woman at that time period than John the Baptist. So there's something about this man. He's not an ordinary man. He's not your typical Baptist, if you will, up and down and in and out and all these things. He loved God. He served God. He was faithful to God. Yet he and all his troubles can question God. Yet when trouble comes, he forgot the blessings. Preacher, how do you say that? Well, he forgot who Jesus was and what he was capable of. How do you figure that out? I'm glad you asked. Remember, it was John who foretold of Christ's coming. He said, I baptize you with water, but the one coming behind me is mightier than I. He'll baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. And, and he said, I'm not even able to unlatch his shoes. He said, I can't even put his shoes on. I can't even untie his shoes or tie them, much less put them on my feet. He forgot how high and holy God truly was. I'm afraid you and I tonight have dumbed down who God is and what he is. And now he's our friend and our pal and our chum. And I understand scripturally who and what he is. But we've tried, brought him off his seat and his throne in glory. And now everybody thinks, boy, God will be okay with this. He's my buddy. He's my pal. I can get by with this because of this. And, and make excuses and try to justify ourselves and our sin. But he forgot who he was. It was John who first saw him and looked up in John chapter 1 and said, Behold the Lamb of God. Who taketh away the sin of the world. He forgot about the salvation that Christ brought. The deliverance that he had brought. You and I, when our troubles come, and our burden comes, the last thing I think about is being saved. The last thing I think about is Calvary and the blood that was shown and the love that was shed. I forget all about the goodness and the grace and mercy of God and I start thinking about my problem. Why? Because I'm, I'm selfish. <laughs> I'm selfish. I make it about me a lot of times, and it's never been about me. Never one time has it been about me. It's always been about Him. Right. It's always been about His love and His blood and His grace and His mercy and His church. And it's always about Him, but so many times my life's about me, 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 me. And I fail and I come short. And then I pity party and I pout when I ought to be shouting. Yep. It was John who baptized the Lord Jesus. <coughs> and as he baptized him, he said, Suffer not, Jesus. And he suffered to be so for now. Like, could you imagine that, having the Lord Jesus in your arms? Brother Woody, I baptized him. It's been a wonderful thing. Thank God for it. I'm so unworthy. But he takes the Lord Jesus down to the river Jordan, and he walks him in the water, and he goes to dunk him in the water. The word baptized, some movements can't figure it out. It means to be fully submerged. But either way, that's free. But he fully submerges him underwater as he's bringing him back up out of the water. The Spirit of God comes down in the form of a dove. The Spirit of God always is peace. It's always joy. It's always comfort. He forgot the comfort of knowing who Jesus was. And right in the midst of it all, God steps out on the front door of heaven. Brother Buster seats it and kicked the front door open and said, This is my beloved son, and whom I'm well pleased to hear him. I'm talking about a man that had seen some things. Preacher, what do you mean? That in your life, if you've been saved very long, you've seen some things. You've seen God move, and it wasn't nobody but God. The doctor couldn't take credit, the preacher couldn't take credit. It was God Himself. Praise His, Praise his holy name. But yet, when our troubles come, we forget all about the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God. 
We forget all about that last test or that last <coughs> trial, that last bit of bad news that God comforted us through and that God brought us through and that God delivered us from. Right. It was John who got to go down and preach out in the wilderness. He, while he, he had the first fast food, I think, in the Bible. Wild locusts and honey. You had to be real fast if you was going to get that. You was going to get stung. Amen. But he saw, he preached out there and he baptized many. Preacher, what do you mean by that? He forgot about the purpose and the power of Christ. What is the purpose of our life tonight? Why are we here? What are we to do in this life? God didn't just leave us here to struggle. God didn't just leave us here to suffer. He saved us when he came and he got his disciples, when he found his friends, amen. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There's a lost and dying world out there not on their way to hell. It's far off worse than you and I. And you and I have got the keys to the kingdom. You and I have got the good news. That we've been looking at Acts for, for the longest, and I sure have enjoyed that good Sunday school. Paul could have said, it's enough, I quit. Peter could have said, I'm done with it. You've done me wrong, and you've done this. And you and I probably would have. But right in the midst of it all, when Jesus is headed straight on to Calvary, he said, hey, I've got much needs to go to Samaria. Aren't you glad that morning, that night, whenever it was, as wretched and as rotten as we was, and boy, Jesus should have just passed right by me. The vultures wouldn't even stop, Brother Woody. I'm glad he said, I've got much needs to stop by my student home in Fountain City. There's some folks out there that need comfort and need help, but more importantly, there's a sinner out there on his way to hell, and I need to stop by and introduce myself to him. I'm glad when everybody else give in and give up, and everybody else throw their hands up, I'm glad he'd come by my way. <coughs> Having everybody else give up, there was still somebody willing to witness to me. I'm glad when a lot of preachers had sold out, there was still a man of God willing to preach me the Word of God. Amen. It wasn't popular. Hey, it ain't ever been popular, but it's always been right. It ain't pleasing to me. No, it's not, but it sure pleases the Father. But yet when his troubles came, he questioned Jesus. And to ask why is one thing. I don't think God's even got to explain why. I've talked to folks, and I might have told you this before. If I do, just pretend like you didn't hear it and act, act excited. People say, well, I'm going to ask God when we get to heaven. Why do you want to know about this life? The splendors of heaven, everything that's going on up there. Why in the world do I want to remember back to time like this? I don't think it's going to matter. I think when God wipes away all of our tears, I think He's going to erase our memory, and I don't think it's even going to matter. Any of y'all ever had a brand new car before? Brand new one. I mean, straight off the shoulder of the floor. Have you ever had one? You traded in your old one, didn't you? Was there something wrong with it? Probably. A lot of times when people trade in and get it, I want this thing to be wore out and broke down when I get my glorified body. <laughs> Don't you? Not used up for the devil. Used yeah, up for a lot of times when people trade in their cars, there's something wrong with it. Yeah. And I've traded in, I don't know if we've ever had a truly brand new car. Most of them have been a few years old, been at least turned in. Thank God for that. Saved thousands. Amen. Yeah. Still get a decent vehicle with warranty. But you know, the last thing I ever thought about when I traded in, I got something new. Well, I wonder what happened to my old one. Man, I care less where that thing went. I'm glad it's gone. Why would I be worried about this life? But anyway, y'all didn't got me chasing rats. Miss Christie's fault. She looked up and smiled and then started writing. She wrote the book. But yet when troubles came, he didn't ask Jesus why. He said, are you him? Are you him? Aren't thou he that we should look for? Look we for another. I began to think about these things. And I'm going to be honest with you. If you ain't, if you ain't honest, you ain't going to get no help. I believe we're a lot like John in our day. We've had the many blessings on our life. We've saw the goodness of God. We've seen God move in our lives, in our hearts, in our homes, in our churches. Yet we too, according to burden and situations and circumstances, and things out of our control, we've been to question, we began to question God, whether we did it literally by opening our mouth or physically in our minds or mentally in our minds. We begin to wonder, are you him or should we look for nothing? When our faith gets low, it causes us to doubt. And it begins to take away our joy, leaving us defeated and discouraged. But I want to preach for just a few minutes tonight. I've drawn you a big, long illustration, took you around the mountain, and get you back in the point. I want to preach for just a few minutes tonight on a simple thought. He's still God. Amen. 
He's still God. No matter where you are, no matter what you're going through tonight, He is still God. He always was, He always has been, He always will be. In the beginning, He was God. In the end, He's God. Amen. He is God. Amen. He's still God. Notice in verse 20, right quick. We'll go back to these verses and I'm finished. When the men were come unto, unto, unto Him... They said, John Baptist had sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? I want you to imagine this journey for just a few minutes. I don't know how long these disciples have walked with John, but they saw a lot of things, no doubt. They've heard a pretty rough old hard Baptist preacher, if you will. He preached some pretty rough sermons. They made your generation of hypers. They made what come you out and to see? I don't know, but I don't know if they've grown a big crowd in there, but it's still true. But they've heard a lot of things and seen a lot of things. And they're already discouraged and heard enough that, that their leader, if you will, the one that came to prepare the way and make it straight for our Savior, the one that came for that plan and that purpose, he came to die. John the Baptist came to believe and die just as Christ did in reality. He came to make the way and then get out of the way. He said, I must decrease that he might increase. And, and he came and did all these things. His disciples has been with him on this walk. And I'm sure he was always a man that trusted God and believed God. But now the pastor of their church, if you will, has got discouraged. He's not exhorting and helping them anymore. He said, hey, I want you to go see if that's the man. So here they've walked. And I bet this has been a sad journey. Preacher, why would it be sad? Their leaders are about to be put to death. That'd be sad enough anyway. Now their faith's at an all-time low because he's discouraged, they're discouraged, and they're not even sure if he's the one. Their whole life and ministry could potentially be wasted at this point. And their friend might be about to die for no reason. Think about that. There's a lot at stake here with this question they're asking. There's a lot of things going on. And, and notice, they ask him in verse number 20 a question. They said, are you the one who should come or look we for another? Really, I'll need two questions, I guess, because there's two question marks. Verse number 21. There, there's some things I'd like to ask God that I'm kind of scared to ask, just to be honest with you. Verse 21, watch this. And in the same hour, he cured many of their, I underline that in my Bible. Many of their infirmities, not, not others, but theirs. The people that come had some infirmities about them. Many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits and, and unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Have you ever prayed and God didn't say nothing? Isn't that in reality what this would have been, Brother Woody? Them going and asking something of Jesus, if you will, a, a typology of prayer. They come and they ask a question. They come and they ask something to God. And he didn't say nothing. But he did something. <laughs> See, there's times that I try to listen with these physical ears and I try to look with these physical eyes and I don't realize God's not only doing something on me, he's doing something in me. Do you see that? Jesus didn't answer them with words, but with deeds. If you remember, he told you and I to love not in word only, but in deeds. It's one thing for you to tell me you love me. I don't know how many people I've had, Miss Christie, I love you and I appreciate you. Next thing you know, there's a knife buried when they go to hug you. They show love different some people. Some people live in tough love, I guess, kind of different. I'm glad when Jesus said, I love you, he shows it. What's the old saying? People don't know how much, don't care how much you know, they know how much you care. But notice this. It says in that same hour, that phrase in that same hour, in case you're wondering, it means right then or immediately. I'm glad when one of God's children cries out, God hears them right then. I'm glad we're not speaking to some answering service that might get lost or it might get covered up by so many others and might get deleted for spacious reasons. But I'm glad God hears right where you are, right when you call it. In the same hour, Jesus showed them some miracles. Notice he had to do a work on them. These were their plagues. These were their infirmities. These were their problems. Before he could answer them, before he could speak to them, he wanted to show them some things. Notice their burden. I'm just going to give you some definitions right here. Notice their burden, their problem, their issue, their very reason for coming to Jesus, if you will, had caused some infirmities. 
I looked up that word infirmities. I was really impressed and, and kind of excited about what it meant. That word infirmities right here in this text, it means moral disability. I thought, huh. Well, their infirmities led to some plagues. And I thought, man, plagues. That word plagues right here, it means misfortune and trouble. And it had brought out evil spirits and blinded their eyes. But how do you figure that? That doesn't make sense to the mind, does it? When our faith gets low, our morals begin to change. <coughs> Have you noticed that? People that's getting, let me draw you an illustration so you're sure to get this. People that's been in church, preachers, deacons, Sunday school teachers, whoever, you name it, claim it, whatever you want. If they start getting away from God, they start getting out of church for whatever reason. That could be you or me next. I'm not above that. You're not either. But when they start getting away, their morals begin to change. Things that used to be wrong, now they're doing that. Things that used to offend them or bother them, they stood directly against. Now they're taking part in it. And it doesn't just happen in the great big mega church. It happens in old-fashioned, independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist church. And these men were still in church. They were still coming to their preacher. They were still hearing the message. But they wasn't applying it anymore. I wonder how many in our day come in and they hear the message. They say, boy, that's a good message. I enjoyed that. And they turn and they walk off. Go out and do the very same thing they did that day or the day before. Like water on a dust bag. Just, just shake it off. Just shake it off. But then their, their morals begin to change. And you know what happens when your morals start to change? You already had problems. You already had troubles. That, that, that word there that we just talked about plagues, misfortune and trouble. Your troubles get worse the further you get away from God. Your misfortunes, they start calling it luck. Luck's the root word of Lucifer. I don't have luck tonight. But things started getting worse the way of a transgressor's home. And things get harder and harder and harder and harder. What is that? That's God's trying His best to bring you back. It did not surprise Jesus when these men come walking up and ask Him a question. He was delighted to have a conversation with them here in just a minute. But before He could talk to them, they, He could preach to them, they just blew in the face. They wasn't going to hear what was going on. He had to do something in them before He could speak to them. Why is that? Because this is a spiritual book. My word is... Spirit, my word is true. A lost and dying world picks up this book right here and says, I can't comprehend it. I can't understand it. And so I've got to get one of these other perversions and pick it up and try to read it and try to figure it out. Oh, I can understand what that says. Well, look who that thing's wrote by, number one, figure that out. I ain't got time to deal with that tonight. But the thing is, I so I can understand it now. Without the Spirit, you're not ahead. Without the Spirit, you can't understand what he's saying. And it's the same way if either you don't have the Spirit or if you're in the wrong Spirit. Amen. Yeah. These men weren't in the right spirit. They weren't looking for the right things. Jesus' disciples said, hey, you want us to call down fire on them and destroy them? He said, Elijah done it. You know, we know it's in the Bible. He said, the problem is you don't know what spirit you're in. I want to call out some sheep every once in a while. Let them destroy some children for the way they act. Amen. Read about that over there. I'm not of that spirit. I need to be of grace and mercy and long-suffering and kindness, the fruits of the Spirit now. Yes. But notice the, the reaction when, when these plagues come and the infirmities come. And then we, we see the evil spirit. People that I've worshipped with, that I've shouted with, that I've preached with in meetings and everything else, they've had these issues and problems come in their life and things come around, and now their spirit's not the same. You go talk to them about God, His love, His grace, His mercy, and they want nothing to do with it. What happened? The devil snuck in, and they didn't realize it. He can do that in your life, and he can do it in my life, but he's real good at what he does. But now we don't have the right spirit. You know what it's done? It's blinded our eyes to the things of God. The old John the Baptist, before this trouble came along, would have been praising God that all these things that were going on had been happening. We had a young man get saved by the good grace of God in this building right here last Wednesday night. And we should still be shouting the house down. Amen. But now it's just another day. You beat us up? No, I'm, I'm telling you the reality. 
Many of us, through troubles and trials, have been left defeated and discouraged. They brought out evil spirits and they closed their eyes toward the blessings of God. A lot of times we don't remember who he is, what he does, much less what he's done. So the first thing Jesus did, the Bible said, was cure the name of their problem. I like that word. I like that word. That word cure, it means to serve. It means to heal. It means to heal. And it means to restore. See what he did, brother? When he brought them back to a blessed state. That's my Jesus right there. That's my Savior. That's what he does. When my heart's falling apart, when my home's broken, when everything else doesn't make any sense, when I'm ready to throw in the towel and give in and give up, I'm glad he comes and he cures me, aren't you? I'm glad he's the servant of servants tonight. And I'm glad he still comes and he picks up the broken pieces and he puts it back together. And I'm glad he don't throw the clay away, aren't you? I'm glad he makes a difference. Praise his holy name. Praise you, Lord. I read that definition. I'm about to have spray. I begin to think how in our day we need to be cured. A couple other definitions for that word, too. It means to be restored. It means to be revived. Church, you and I need to be excited about the things of God. I went last Tuesday to the Buddy's Barbecue over on Kingston Pike. And they're lined out the door of that place, that 649 Tuesday special. I just lined out the door and I was like, I ain't waiting for this. I ain't doing this. There was some young girl up there on the cash register, probably 18, 19 years old, something like that. And she had one of the best attitudes anybody I've seen for a long time. People fussing at her and rude to her because she ain't got her food. Us. They must be Baptist folks. And I mean, just, just ill-tempered toward this little girl. And man, she just made a joke out of everything and laughed and cut up and had a wonderful time. I said, man, I want to be around people that's got a sweet spirit, amen. That's what we need in our day now. Not a bunch of sourpusses, but somebody that's got something sweet about them. Can I give you two commercials right quick? If I had a, anything I was trying to sell you or offer you, and I'd just sit there and I'm just blah the whole time, how would you like to try this chicken sandwich I have? It's dry and it doesn't taste very good, and, and it might be raw or it might be burnt, and the bun's probably going to be stale, the mayonnaise's probably going to be bad, and da, da, da. Are you coming to my restaurant? No! But then again, if I say, man, you need to come over here. Man, that chicken's heavenly and the fries are crispy. And man, we've got some apple pie or peach cobbler, whatever your favorite dessert is, and it's out of this world. We got manna from heaven. Man, you're going to be more interested in that, ain't you? That's the way the child of God needs to be. We're inviting people to the house of God. I don't care what the piano player did or the preacher did or the deacon did 50 years ago, the Sunday school teacher. You tell me what Jesus did there Sunday, amen. You tell me what he did when he came into your life and the difference he made. We need some people to excited about serving God. We need to be revived. We need to be restored. We need Jesus to cure us, amen. My little speaker, she loves to eat lemons. I told her, I said, you're going to, tear, you're going to take all the enamel off your teeth and rot your teeth out before you turn seven years old. And I see her face and I said, yeah, you look just like a lot of people I know me preach to. Huh? She at least smiles while she's eating. We need to be excited about some things. I joked with you about her being partially Pentecostal. It's all right to get loud. It's all right to get excited. It's all right to be happy, Amen. You sing that song, if you're happy, you know it, clap your hand. But be careful. You can sing a lie as well as you can tell one. You make sure your face knows you're happy before you start clapping. How did I get into all that? I ain't coming back to that side anymore. Where was I? But I like this. After he does the work on them, after they've been cured, if you will, notice verse 22. Then, Jesus answered. Now that they've got their sight back, now that they've got their heart right. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way. Why could they go their way now? Because their way now is going to be God's way. Too many times I was going my own way to begin with, but now that he's got their heart right and their mind right and got their eyes open to the things that really matter, and they see the benefits and serving, and they see the blessings of God, he said, Now go your way. And tell John. What things you've seen and heard. Go your way and tell John. He didn't rebuke them. That's right. 
Aren't you glad for that? He didn't rebuke him. He knew that was broken. He knew that was bitter. He knew that was hindered. He knew that was hurt. He knew that was trouble. He knew all these things. But he did not rebuke them. And so he just picked them up and he loved them. Amen. That's Amen. my shepherd right there in the 23rd Psalm. Sometimes he's got to break me. Sometimes he's got to pick me up and carry me around. But I'm glad that he makes me lie down in the green pastures, aren't you? I'm glad he restores my soul. I'm glad he takes care of me. And then when I'm ready to get back with the herd, he says, hey, go your way. He didn't rebuke them. He encouraged them and persuaded them to continue. He encouraged them to believe. But you notice what he said. He said, I want you to go back and tell them the things you've seen and the things that you've heard. Not only what I told you or what you heard about me, but he made it personal. He said, I want you to go tell John what I did for you. Before he was going to see it, tell him what he saw and heard. They said, hey, we saw this happen. We saw this miracle. We saw that. But now when it came this time, instead of saying they did it for Peter, James, or John, he said, I want you to go back and tell John that I did it for you. You know what that is tonight, church? That's your testimony. That's your testimony. Everybody in this building tonight that's saved by the grace of God has a testimony. And you know what's good about them? They're all somewhat the same, yet they're all different. Some's been raised in church the whole life. Thank God for a godly heritage, for godly parents and all those things. And, and didn't have to get out and get scarred by the things of the world. Thank God for that. But others like me weren't that way. And we had to go out and we had to learn the hard way. But I'm glad the same God of grace and mercy come and found me where I was and went way below the bottom down to where I was at and picked me up and set my feet on a solid rock. And he established my God and put a new song in my heart, even a song of praise. A biography is one thing, but an autobiography is another. See, if you write a book about somebody else, you, you can't tell it the way they told it. You can't get the, 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 the color right, if you will, in your mind. You can't get the characteristic right. My son loves to tell stories of things that he's heard me or his mama tell, and, and I love him to death, but he always misses a piece or a part. He was like, yeah, how'd that go? But nobody can tell your story like you can. You don't have to know every verse in this Bible. We ought to. We ought to be at least studying trying to. But you know the greatest thing that you and I have tonight, Paul used it more than anything, his testimony. Whether he was standing before the king or whether he was with the Jews or the Gentiles, it didn't matter. That was how he started his conversation, Brother Gary. Let me tell you about this one time I was on the Damascus Road. Man, I was headed that way and I was doing this and there was a great light shone down on me. Do you remember when you saw the light? It didn't matter if it was bright as day outside, 100 degrees in August. There was a light brighter than that you in. Or if it was a deep, deep, dark night, there was a light shone about where you were. That's the greatest thing we have. What we need this day and hour is to remember what God's done for you and I. Simply remember who he is. What he's done, what he does, what he's doing, and what he's going to do. We can get excited about everything else but God in our day and time. I used to aggravate him all the time over at church, and I said, There's 100,000 idiots somewhere shouting, fixing the bus through a powerless T. I said, Man, they couldn't beat Bob Cam. I said, people go out and spend that money and shout. And I said, yeah, on Sunday they come in here quiet as a church. I was aggravating one lady that way for the longest time. A couple of weeks later, man, next day I know I was preaching. She got up and started shouting and running all over the building. And she said, preacher, you had nerve when you said that. She said, I go to my grandkids, Little League game. She said, I shout about everything back. We just need people excited. I don't want anything fake or phony or anything going on. I just want people to get sincere. Remember who you were and where you were when he found you. Don't stay back in that. Don't revel in that. He said he brought us out that he might bring us in. He brought us out of some things, but he's taking us into something far, far better. That's right. See, we forgot who he is and what he does. We forgot what he's done for us personally. Mm -hmm. If John, I think, would have been sitting there, and John's far better than I am. I'm not beating up John. I've been John many a times, but in this side of John. 
And I bet if he was sitting there thinking, said, what about this one and what about that? If he was thinking about, boy, he was, he was, I got to stand there and baptize him. I got to see the Spirit of God. I got to preach that message. I got to do it all because of him. His attitude would have probably been totally different. And then he said, well, when you give me your testimony, he said, go ahead and preach God a little message right there. This might be the last one of you. What kind of a message is it that they're going to preach? He didn't say, only tell them what you've seen and what you've heard. He said, I want you to tell them what the blind see. That the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the, the, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and all those things sound good. But you know what my favorite part of that message is? the poor. The gospel's true. Yeah. There ain't none of those statements, Miss Francis, would have meant a hill of beans to me. But I'm glad to the poor. Amen. The gospel's true. I'm glad it doesn't matter how much you've got or how much you don't have. It doesn't matter which side of the tracks you've grown up on, where your house is, or if you're homeless. I'm glad the gospel's been sent to you. And I love letter from the Lord. Amen. So I want you to know. See, John wasn't in the palace when he was arrested, but I know of him cast in there. Most of the time, he was like Jesus. He was out in the wilderness somewhere. He said, John, even though if you leave and die, even if this is your end, I want you to know your ministry's carrying on. For what a great blessing that'd be for a man of God to know that my ministry's going to outlive me. I want you to know that I'm going to send somebody behind you. And, and even though they kill you, your ministry ain't going to die. There's somebody still going to go out to the widow. Somebody's still going to go out to the orphan. Somebody's still going to go out to the homeless. And they're still going to take the gospel. But what a blessing that is. What a blessing. I'm afraid we've got a lot of Johns in our day. We need to know that he's still God. And he tells them all those things. He said, I want you to know something. I'm still good. And I'm still God. And besides me, there is none other. Yeah. I think when they got back, I guarantee you, John told them boys, he said, hey, you don't need to look for another. That's him. That's him. That's the one. That's the one the Father sent. That's the one that I baptized. I'm still not worthy to tie his shoes. Amen. That's still him. He's still God. Amen. I guarantee you, when they come and took his head, it didn't bother him here as much then when he had a message from heaven. <coughs> I don't know what's going to happen before this thing, though. We might all be in jail somewhere. And I sure would like to be like Paul and Silas at the midnight hour singing victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Mm -hmm. Lifting up holy hands, praising Him because He's worth Maybe we we'll be like Paul and have to give my head for the gospel's sake. But I guarantee you, Paul, as he stood there, he's been in a great strait between the two for a long time, had a desire.